Welcome back, welcome back. It's another episode with the MVM Show. I'm Titus. And yes, I lied to you guys. I said I was going to be back to get two out a week. And some other stuff came on. A lot of stuff going on with our church and stuff like that. We call it camp meeting. Just It's a lot of services, a lot of things going on. People from out of state. Stuff like that. So yeah, I apologize. I did say I was going to get back to two a week after this last couple weeks with work, but the cool thing is I'm pretty sure most everybody that listens to this podcast are blue-collar men and women, and they know how that is with work and life and all that other stuff. It's not my full-time job. It's something I do because I like it, and it's something I do because it's fun, and and I like trying to help people as well on all those levels. So anyways... We talked about last time about the Delta Waterfowl Expo. Super stoked for that. In fact, just bought our plane tickets today. And we're flying southwest into Little Rock and really pumped about that for the Delta Waterfowl Expo in Little Rock, Arkansas on the 28th, 29th, and 30th. So pumped about that. Kevin's going to be there. Polly's going to be there. Some of the people you've seen in the hunt videos, Thomas, me and Thomas are going together. And, um, yeah, we're just going to be roving around and meeting people, shaking hands, kissing babies. and Also, we are going to be spending a lot of time at the Heavy Shop booth. So if you guys are there, um, Tina just told me yesterday that she was not going to be there to attend. We're, she's a really good friend of ours there at Heavy Shot, and, uh, but Scott is going to be. Scott Turner will be there, and he's going to be representing Heavy Shot, and he's very knowledgeable, knows a lot of stuff, and I'd like to actually record some podcasts uh, while I was there, but I might be lazy and not want to bring all this gear to do it, so I might regret that, actually I probably know I'm going to, and man, I would love to get the content for you guys, but at the same time, spend the time there to do that when you're at a function like that that has so many things going on, and it probably takes every bit of the two and a half days that it's going because I believe the first day it's only from noon to five. And then I think it's like nine or 10 till five or six and that rest of the nights. And then I think Friday night is at the actual banquet, which I don't think I'm going to buy tickets for that just for all, because of all the money that we're spending flying out there and then rooms and food and all that stuff. So Anyways, the reason I bring that up again for the third time is if you haven't heard on the other ones or also if you go there. So if you live in Arkansas or anywhere around there, uh, man, come by. Let's let's hook up. Let's say, let's say hi. Let's talk ducks. Let's talk strategies. Let's talk whatever. I mean, let's just have a good time. I think, I think the whole vibe and the whole atmosphere there is going to be pretty charged just because it is a strictly waterfowl based expo most of the expos i've ever been to has always just involved a lot of different you know big game and all that stuff which is totally fine but i think everybody that's going to be there excuse me for the most part is going to be people that duck hunt and it's just fun because we all we're all crazy and i think we'll have a good time talking about so if you're anywhere in the area or you plan on going you see us come up to us shit let's shake hands let's talk ducks um, the other thing is, too, the reason I brought up Heavy Shot's booth is we'll we'll be in and out of that booth quite a bit, talking to people, or on Instagram, follow us on there, and when that's going on and you see, hey, we're at booth such and such, I don't know what booth they have yet, but I'll put it on my stories on Instagram, which would also be on Facebook, and if you're in the area or if you're at the expo, it's like, okay, I'm going to be here from like 12 to 2 at the booth, you know, come by and say hi, whatever, and let's talk. And we can talk ammo, we can talk ducks, we can talk whatever, life, I don't care. It'd just be nice to shake people's hands and meet people. So that being said, um, this episode is, again, me just getting something out. um, And this will be a beneficial one, I think, because there was questions you guys asked back in May 12th on Instagram when I said, do you have any questions that, that you'd like to be answered on the podcast? And you guys sent quite a few in. Um, some I'll save for later. Um, let me see here. What? How did I word that? I want to make sure before I say this. Yeah, I just asked questions for podcasts. So I'm going to go ahead and start answering these, and I'll read off the name of the people that asked them, or at least their handle on Instagram. So let's get started. Uh, Mo 
underscore ran 85 said ever hunt cali brant best tasting waterfowl they pass through our humboldt bay so no i have not and i've been wanting to for years in fact we me and thomas vowed up and down last year that we were going to hunt brant and we had the time slot in and we just did not do it um I don't really have a good reason why we didn't do it other than we get caught up in other things. Duck hunting is going good in other places or we get other plans and they, they seem to pan out better and it's just me and him going anyway. So it's like we can change those plans pretty easy and not really affect us. not like we're affecting somebody else. Um, I kind of like the challenge. Some people have said, hey, you go with us if you want or whatever. Or we'll show you where to go. And it's like, man, I kind of like the challenge of just us trying to go on our own. Then on the other hand, it's kind of like, man, it'd be nice to go with someone that knows what they're doing. But again, I, I'm always just, I don't know what it is about me and the challenge of doing something myself. I promise I'm not a, <clears throat> I'm not a recluse. I'm not wanting to go around other people, but I do enjoy the challenge of like trying to do stuff ourselves and trying to figure it out. And then the, and then kind of like the victory of doing it and making it happen. You know what I mean? So I don't know. Um, this year we haven't spent a lot of time talking about it. I don't even know. It's not really on our calendar of plans that we have. I would like to do it. I've heard it's crazy. I hear all these war stories about how crazy it gets over there for the California Brant. So I, I don't know. That doesn't scare us at all, and we're not worried about that, but we definitely would like to get out to it. And if it happens, it happens. I think I feel like it's going to be one of those things. I'm worried about that on another sense, though, that if we don't force ourselves to do it, we may never do it, you know. So I don't know. But uh, that was that question. Jake underscore B-U-P-P underscore... 2006 said do you like using more decoys in an area or less i i personally if i had to choose just for the fact of either carrying them or wading down your boat with decoys i'd the less the better to me like if i can get away with four decoys i would do that my whole hunting career that being said there is something i don't know why oddly satisfying about having like 10 10 dozen decoys, um, hunting over them and killing birds. I don't know. I think because it just looks like a closed zone. It just looks crazy. There's a lot of decoys. You got pulsators everywhere. You got movement, jerk, whatever, jerk strings or spinner wings. I mean, it's just like, man, this is kind of sick looking, you know? Like, it's just got that look and it. It's like, how could birds not want to come down here? So that is have its cool factor in itself. But to be reasonable and realistic – you know, if you're in a boat and you could just toss four decoys in, which is probably never going to happen, why do that if you have a boat? Or if you're using a cart and you want to get away light, definitely I would say go with less. Um, and I will say this too. Sometimes later in season, less is better. And we've done so many podcasts on this over the years. Excuse me. Keep yawning. <laughs> We've done so many of these podcasts over the years talking about this, and I just feel like as a waterfowl-heavy podcast, we do a lot of other things too, but as a waterfowl-heavy podcast, I think you doing this once or twice a year is never going to get old. It's something we always like to hear and think about and hear someone else's strategy or how they do it, you know, but late in the season, I feel like when you kind of go lighter on the decoys and make little small pockets of ducks like two two here me and thomas did that last year i think it was in january and we had a great hunt i think we limited out we went in the afternoon these guys had been there all morning up until like two we were waiting kind of waiting on them to get out hoping like man i hope these guys are leaving we're gonna have to commit we kind of want to go where they're at but we could it sound like they were picking decoys up we're probably you know we're on the bank and we're probably i don't know three four hundred yards away from these guys but it was kind of a windless day and we could hear clanking of the decoys were like well, they have to be picking up and they were kind of talking loud really wasn't a lot of birds flying but there was definitely birds working just that time of year you know in january well here sure enough we seen them heads bobbing through the the toolies and i'm like oh good sweet we're gonna be able to get out there 
And it's always a kind of weird thing when guys come in and they maybe didn't do that good and they've been there all day, they're tired, they're hungry, and you're going out there and they're looking at you like, uh, there ain't nothing going on, man. Good luck. You know, that's what they're saying, basically. Good luck. We're going out there thinking we know what's going to happen later, you know, or whatever. At least we think we do. And sure enough, we get out there and I used to be kind of a stickler about doing the decoys, but the longer Thomas has hunted, the longer I, I honestly, I don't know. I just don't, I don't care as I do have an opinion. Trust me. Thomas will vouch for that. If he was here, we'd probably get into it about that. Who knows? But he would have to admit that I'm nowhere near like I was. There may be something I'm like, I just, I don't like that. Just that's got to move, even though it doesn't even probably matter. And the ducks probably don't care. It's just in my own head. Right. But he kind of wanted, to, he had an idea how he wanted to do. It. I'm like, go for it. I didn't, I mean, I think I might've moved one pulsator in a different spot, but I think I brought two pulsators. He brought two or three. And then we brought like eight decoys and we put like, tried to match what it looks like that time of year. We put like two in that pocket, one in this little pocket, kind of spread out actually in a bigger area than you would be comfortable with thinking, okay, some of these decoys are a little bit out of range, but we just have enough experience that they never really land uh, I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that. Since everything, everybody hangs on words I say, I got to be careful how I say things because I'm just telling you some days it works out and some days it doesn't. Okay. So we had some decoys 60 yards away, some decoys right on top of us. But what we did is we, where we were hunting was little tiny pockets, like little, little pockets, little sparse grass pockets. So there'd be a little bit of, you know, a uh, little bit of grass here. My goodness, the, the the name of the feed is going duckweed. So there was some duckweed. And so, like, you could see the water through it. It wasn't big tulies, but it was the little, there'd be tulies around and there'd be an open pocket of water with a little bit of duckweed in there, some smart weed, a little mixed in. It's just like duck heaven, right? And um, we would put like one or two in there, almost kind of hidden. And this is a tactic I've learned over the years and also learned from other people that gave me some good ideas. It's like in late in the season, you almost kind of want to hide your decoys. This is kind of a little secret little trick of ours that I think some people would think, oh, that don't make sense. I would never do that. But if you've been hunting hunt long enough, you know going to well this would work. And it works. You kind of tuck your decoys up a little tighter to the toolies a little bit. So not every angle are they going to be seen because what do we all do most of the time or most duck hunters, right? They throw all our decoys right out in the middle, right in the wide open. We want everything to see it. Well, of course you do. Yes, you do want the birds to see the decoys so they can be attracted. But what you don't realize sometimes is the fact that how often do birds ever come in the first straight line pass, see your decoy and boom, just right in. Never. They usually do one or two passes, maybe three, to look at the area and see what they think if they want it. So what the, my point is, if you put, say birds are coming from the north, you want to have maybe one or two on the south against the Thule line where they can see just those two. And they're like, okay, well, when they do a swoop around, maybe you've got two, three decoys on the north side of where you're hunting against the toys. So when they make that swing, they lose sight of the ones on the south. Now they see the ones in the north. It, you see what I'm saying? So they're strategically kind of placed throughout, throughout because by this time, most birds have seen so many decoys. They've seen so many different things and, and, and pulsators and twitchers and twisters. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's so many things that we're using in tactics and that's great. But when you kind of almost make it hard to see, it's more realistic because the birds can't sit there and stare at that on their whole pass all the way to the 360 circle around it and look down at it. I'm like, oh, that's that's a decoy. That thing hasn't moved in you know 20 seconds. And birds, you believe it or not, um, people that aren't duck hunters would say, oh, they don't notice that stuff. If you do duck hunt, you know good and well they do. So, yes, strategically place those strategically don't just put stuff always out in the middle of the pond. Um, study birds in the off season. That's the biggest thing is what I don't, I don't think people do is 
I like watching birds in the off season. I like going to drive through closed zones and places and, and ponds and parks, watching birds, how they react and how they do things and how they communicate with each other and how they're stacking up on the bank and how they're on this island and when it's big water, how they setting up out there. That's what I want to emulate. That's what makes you a better hunter. Just going out there doing what everybody on the ground does, throw three dozen decoys out in wide open in the middle and getting the blind, that's not going to work every time. It may work a lot of times, it may work some of the time, or it may work, may work none of the time. But you got to be willing to learn and put the effort in. So that would be my little rant for decoys right now. My buddy and my neighbor, R.L.Fiero, Ray, what's up, man? Shout out. If you listen to this one, he said, what's something that you haven't shot yet that is on your checkoff list or bucket list, basically? And that for sure, no doubt about it. Um, I want to shoot a Harlequin and uh, I blew it. I had two, three contacts that in Washington that been saying, come up, shoot a Harlequin. We can do it for sure. The first day, no problem. Me, Travis Thomas, we're going to do it. Didn't work out, didn't work out, didn't work out. And then last year they took them off. So I haven't I haven't heard any rumors or hubbub about if Washington's going to open the Harlequin back up this year or not. I have a feeling they probably won't. Usually it's never an on-off or off-on thing like that. It's always going to be two or three years or maybe never, which is scary. That's how things work. But um, the King Eider is, always, it, it is and always will be my number one. But the reality of it is very tough. It's not possible, and I believe I'm going to make it happen one day, but the cost and the price is just so much. It's just, I've really got to commit to it, and I'm just not at that point right now, you know, financially where I've got that money set aside for that, because that is my dream, dream, dream hunt, is to shoot a king eider. So you got to go look them up. One of the most, to me, one of the most beautiful waterfowl species on the planet, um, and then, like I said, the Harlequin, which that's way more doable. I mean, we could do that in Alaska now, too, if we want. Um, can't do it in Washington just because of the rules. So hopefully that opens back up and we can go do it there. If not, maybe when I do go to Alaska, which I hope to within the next couple of years, to knock off some more birds and more knock off waterfowl hunting in Alaska. That's I think that's my biggest thing is just hunting there. Um, for waterfowl. It's not necessarily like I had to shoot some bucket list bird, but there is a lot of birds there that I haven't shot yet. So that I really, if I had to pick, I'd rather shoot a Harlequin in Alaska. But if Washington opens back up, if they open it this year, I'm definitely going. Like I'm 100% going and I know who I'm calling. That's con- That can take us out there. So I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah, that would be, those two would be, I mean, there's more than that. I'm gonna. I want to shoot a black duck. I'd like to go with Thomas from Hoke Outdoors. I'd really like to go with him. But then also, I have a friend down in Louisiana that says they're thick down there in some of the parts where he goes. And I thought, man, that'd be kind of sick too to go go with him, especially when he says there's as many as there is. So I don't know. That's it's a hard decision because not like I said, not only am I wanting to go hunt things for what they are, but for where they are, like. You know, if I, certain species that Florida has, maybe Louisiana has, but some of them I'd rather just shoot in Florida just because for the fact that shoot them in Florida. You know, uh, black duck, that'd be awesome. And it sounds like I could shoot one pretty easy in Louisiana, but I feel like I need to shoot one on the East Coast, you know, like in Virginia or something. So anyways, that's just a thought. Um Fish Slayer underscore 29. Thank you for sending a question. He said, does wind speed affect a hunt? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have a windy day and you got somewhere you can hunt, you need to make it out there. Um, I would say more so on a north wind, not necessarily a south wind. Not saying south winds are bad. It just depends on where you're at, the setting, and the birds. and all. There's a lot of different variables, but most of the time, a north wind's always going to be good duck hunting, uh, from my experience. So, yeah. North wind moves your decoys, and uh, north wind sets the birds up the way that you want. If you position yourself properly with that north wind, you can get them coming in to your decoys right in your face. Um, there's just just lots of factors. Um, it moves the, the cover and the hide, so your movement is not noticed as much. Because a lot of times when it's a windless day, nothing's moving. 
And if you're moving your head, birds can spot that easier. Whereas on a windy day, I've noticed the birds just don't notice you. They just, you, you can almost not even be as hidden and they don't pick you up as good as they would without. Um, we'll do a few more questions and then we'll probably wrap this one up. I got more stuff to do. Oh, here, this is a good one. Uh, Kane, A G U I O seven said, what do you think about ghost versus mountain? Dude, this is a good conversation. I actually wish Thomas was on here. We need that. Me and him need to have a whole episode on Mountain Dew and energy drinks. We'll do that soon. I really want to get Tom. I was going to try to get him over here today, but I don't really have time myself. I think he probably could. I just, I don't have time myself. Otherwise, I would. But uh, yeah, how do I? It's not even a com- close comparison. Like, Ghost is good. But then again, I say that, but I almost feel like I'm forcing myself to stay to say that, to be honest with you. Ghost, Ghost is really sweet. Like, I've only had one of them that I didn't, it wasn't overbearing sweet. And I think it was the, um, was it the citrus one? It reminded me not of Nos a little bit. Um, what's the other one in that one can? I can't think of it right now. But like, yeah, all the like, all the other ones, my goodness, they're so sweet. I said, you know what? If you put this, like when I drink, like say sweet tea, okay? And yes, I am from California and I love sweet tea. In fact, I'll take a sip right now. I live and die by sweet tea. I drink a lot more of it than I do water, unfortunately for myself. But um, I, if I want to taste the tea, taste the sugar and all that stuff, I, I don't get why people put so much ice. They fill their cup up with ice, come to the brim, and then put their tea in. I'm like, all, you, all you're drinking is watered-down tea, just like anything else. So that being said, with the ghost, the only way that I think it would taste normal and not overbearingly sweet is if you had a cup full of ice and then poured it into it. And I did that, and it actually mellowed it out and made it taste what I feel like is normal. Like, there, it, Ghost is just insanely sweet, like way too sweet. Now, let me say this. It works. It does give you energy. I will give them that. And I like, like the flavors taste like what they're trying to copy, but, like, it's just so sweet it almost – like puckers you up. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, Mountain Dew blows, blows uh, ghost, which I don't know if they should be compared. Let's, how about we do this? Mountain Dew's a soda, right? Mountain Dew's its own thing, but let's compare Red Bull to ghost. Um, Red Bull, hands down guys, my opinion uh, right now. And uh, who was one of the listeners? I try to shout the listeners out. You know, when I can, if I think about it, I'm not always the best at it, but let's see who that was. Who sent me that message on Instagram? I think it was, yep, it was Blake. Yeah, so Blake, uh, man, I don't want to butcher your last name, bro, but <laughs> Blake said uh, he, he was listening to the podcast. He was on his way home from a hot day of work and pulling the gas station. He heard heard us say, have you guys tried the Juneberry, and, which is the blue can? And he said, and I, I guess I said, oh, my goodness. That must have been on one, one or two episodes ago. In fact, it's funny because you can see, it was the last episode, you can see on his screen in his truck where he took a picture of the Juneberry Red Bull stacked. You can see the um, his screen in his truck, say the MVM show, which was talking about the Hen House, the DW Expo, and good water and all that stuff. And I asked him, he said, uh, he goes, it's good. He said he liked it. But he said he agreed pomegranate winter is a uh, winter edition, which was, I think it's two years ago now, was number one. And he's don't see him anymore. And the reason that you don't see him anymore is because it, was, it is seasonal, unfortunately. And I was like, I would write Mountain Dew and tell them they got to bring that back. But the thing is, I just feel like they're never going to see my letter and don't care about one guy writing in. But man alive, I wish they'd bring in that pomegranate Red Bull. My goodness, I bought... Because I knew it was a winter edition. I knew it was going to go away. So I bought like probably like 15 cans of it. Um, I bought like 15 cans of it and saved it. And I was cutting into those bad boys. I saved them all the way till next duck season. Um, and they were still just as scrumptious as the first time. But 
I think I'm going to do that with these June berries. I'm going to try to buy a bunch before, because these are summer edition, which to me, I think, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that they kind of taste like uh, like a boysenberry or like blackberry, something like that. I mean, kind of makes sense, right? All those those berries come due in June when you start picking them, I believe. It might be July, but anyways. So yeah, shout out to Corey Ford, my softball coach, and my my junior to me, younger. I don't know if you're watching this or listening to this, Corey, but um, yeah, we have a we have a softball team. This is our second year together. We we have a really good, really good group of guys, and um, I don't know, it's just one of those things. It's fun to do as guys and in the off season, but they know good and well come uh, duck season that uh, me and Thomas are kind of gone. They're, they ain't going to see as much on those weeknight games. But in the off season, that's the, I, we've been staying busy playing tournaments and U-trip tournaments and all this stuff. So it's been really fun. Just got a new bat. Uh, really like it. It's actually uh, a military edition. I don't know if I got the thing pulled up on my internet still, but we were using that. It's not quite all the way broke in. Just doesn't have the pop that used to when a ball or when a bat's broke in but no i guess i don't have a picture of it i was gonna read it but it's cool because there was only like 300 made Corey actually found it for me and i was gonna get a uh, de marini red bat but i ended up getting this this is de marini too but stinking thomas last tournament it we put about 175 hits on it and i'm like all right i'm gonna crush it and i last year i'd hit one or two out every game i this i did wasn't thinking about it. This year, I can't hardly hit it out to save my life. I don't know if it's because I'm thinking about it now. Or I've kind of changed my swing a little bit, my grip, so I don't know if that's part of it. But that sucker hit three out on that last tournament. I'm like, bro, with my bat, you can't be doing that. So I'll just give him a hard time, but we're on the same team, obviously. But it was just kind of funny. But I told Corey that I was gonna. we were uh, our league champions last year, and I was supposed to put up that shirt, I have it in my dresser, but I was supposed to put up that champion shirt up on this. He he didn't believe me that I'll put it up here where everybody can see on the YouTube channel, but I will. In fact, actually what I'll probably do is I was going to have him over for an episode and we'll just talk ball and all that kind of stuff. He plays shortstop really good. Nothing hardly gets by him. But we'll talk softball and maybe in memento of you, Corey, we'll, we'll put that on the wall while you're here for that episode. So... Anyways, uh, yeah, I, I kind of got off that rant with the Red Bulls. But, yeah, Red Bull, like, I like NOS. If you never tried NOS, you got to try it. Uh, the Blue Can, which is the original. They have grape and, I think, sour apple. I've never tried the sour apple. I like sour apple to a point, but not like a big old 24-ounce can of it, I don't think. Maybe like a Jones soda where it's a smaller little bottle or something. But, um, yeah, original NOS. Uh, Juneberry Red Bull, pomegranate Red Bull. I'll drink a original Red Bull if it's like super cold off ice, but I'm not a huge fan of it. The original, I like a watermelon. Um, some some of those taste like potpourri to me. And that there's one flavor I think it was peach mango or something. I was like, man, this thing tastes like potpourri. If I ever was to eat it, you know that stuff your mom like burn. If you're old enough, your mom would put it in that little little cup thing with a little fire under it and would burn it and incense the house that's what i can't remember which flavor tastes like that to me but it's one of those it's garbage i can't remember but i do i will not touch that stuff i think it's the it's it's like a burgundyish reddish can i think it's peach something peach and i love peach what do they mixed it with it's terrible no, it wasn't that one. There was another one. You know what Th- one Thomas likes is Fig Apple, which that was in a winter edition last year. I It was all right, but I wasn't a huge fan. I probably didn't drink enough to like where all of a sudden you really liked it because that's what happened with the Juneberry. It was like, it was good. I was like, oh, this is all right. And then like the next day I was like, man, one of those sounds really good right now. And Corey <laughs> sent me a text. Was it this morning? I think it was. Yeah. No, it was yesterday. He texted me. He goes, oh, these are drugs. I'm telling you, they're drugs. He's got three cans of them uh, that he's drinking, and I'm kind of bad with them right now. They're just they're just so good. But anyways, um, let's get back to a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap this episode up. Which I'm not even gonna have them all. Um, 
Let's see. I'm not even going to have an answer them all, so we will get to them. I'll have Thomas on. Maybe Thomas and Corey will, will talk together and uh, go over some of that stuff. We were, I was saying like softball and energy drinks, Mountain Dew, all that stuff. Um, and we'll, we'll ask you this. Anthone underscore E said ducks or geese. He's asking everyone in California. Ducks all day long. I think you're going to have some spec guys and some honker guys that that's what they would pick over ducks. But I feel like the majority of people would pick ducks. I know I do. I love folding me a big honker. I love folding a spec. And I can't say I've done a ton of it like where it was specific spec only. And I do have some awesome property that I got last uh, two years ago. Didn't get to go last year because it was so hot down here and with floodwaters and all that stuff. And then... Every time I was going to go, the lady that owns the property would tell me how that they're pushed out because she hunts too, and she's like, they're all pushed out. So when I was working, they'd be there. When I'd get off to go up there, they were pushed out. So we'll see. But, yeah, uh, just I think a lot of California guys are big-time duck guys. But that being said, you know, cacklers and all that stuff, I think there's some guys that just live, breathe, and die that. So I definitely don't want to speak for everybody in California. Um let me do one more and then we'll end this. Let's see. Blake Sumner, Blake Summers said, best tasting duck and how do you cook it? Consistently, there's two in my opinion. And they're both amazing tasting. I don't think one tastes better than the other. Except for this. I feel like a fat pintail. There's chance. There's, how do, let me slow this down. I don't want to step all of my words, but... I feel like wood, so wood ducks and pintails are in the same bracket for, as far as taste, in my opinion. Pintails are known to eat only the same things. They don't go like mallards do and eat some random stuff or get salty, you know, get in that salt water and eat, you know, mussels, clams, all that stuff. They don't do that. Pintails only eat bugs and seeds. So their taste is always consistent. I've never had a bad tasting pintail. Wood ducks, I've never had a bad tasting wood duck. But here's the thing. If I had to pick, I am going to go with pintail, and here's why. I've never, ever opened up a super fatty, not saying that's not possible, I'm just saying where I'm at, a super fatty wood duck. They're, they barely have any fat on them, ever. And I, I think it's just where I'm at. It must be because I'm sure that's not always the case. But a pintail, they're not always fatty either. I've shot some scrawny pintails but there's been times that i've seen more fat on a pintail than i've ever seen on a mallard and i'm talking like i feel like i'd be safe to say a quarter inch and it is the whitest fat too it's never not that yellow fat's bad or nothing like that but i've seen i don't know if you've ever seen this like fleshy colored fat on mallards and it's just i don't know it just looks odd and honestly it don't taste that good i'd rather either be really white fat which is the best tasting or really orange or yellowish because of eating corn, what they're eating. But uh, that's my opinion. And how I cook that, that I feel is the most like natural way and probably the way that I would say is the most like raw way to do it is take an iron skillet with some butter or even some duck. Better than that, if you can find at your local store, we have it like our Save Mart is duck fat. Put that duck fat in the skillet and pan sear it. Medium you, or medium rare. It really needs to be medium rare because you do not cook duck, waterfowl, geese, anything. You do not cook them like you cook chicken. It has to be cooked like steak. I know we said that a bunch on here, but for any new listeners, I've got to always repeat that, and it's good for us to hear. you got to cook it like a steak. And I get it. Some people do not like uh, like a medium rare or a medium steak, but here's the thing, then you might as well not waste your time eating duck unless you're going to put it in summer sausage or if you're going to... I mean, there's other ways to do it that you don't have to have raw, you know, raw meat, raw like a pink center. But I'm just saying, if you're going to pants here, don't even waste your time because if you overcook it, it's nasty. It just, it just doesn't taste good. It won't taste good. I've never had one duck pan seared anything over medium medium tastes good so you definitely that's how you got to cook it and if you do that right um 
skin side down first, fat side down first, and you just sear it like high, high heat. But you got to re- use the right grease because if you don't, it's popping, it's bubbling, and it, it can make it taste not that good. Skin side down, and make sure when you do it though, take that breast with all the fat on it, put the slits on it. So, because if you don't do that, that fat will crinkle up to hardly nothing, and it just it's not you're not gonna get the same effect. You definitely want to put the slices in it so it doesn't suck up and pinch up into a little ball in your piece of meat, and do that. And it's usually only like four or five minutes for total till it's done. Pull it off. Even if you think, oh, I don't know if it's quite done enough yet, pull it off. Let it rest for five minutes. Boom. Slice it up just like you would like a filet mignon or a ribeye. And my goodness, it's so good. Pintail, wood duck, and if the mallard is in the right area, which is kind of, that's kind of a chance you're taking. You really don't know. I mean, some of you do. If you're hunting in the coast, you already know. It's like, that's not going to be the best way to make that usually. Um... If you're in the Midwest, I feel like you have a good chance of it. Most of the meat all tasting pretty good and even. But I've had some like, oh, this was, I shot this, you know, in the Sac Valley or in the grasslands. And then you cook, you're like, ugh, this thing is terrible. Like, I don't know what this thing was eating on, but it's garbage. So you just, just got to be cognizant of that. So anyways, that's it. That's the last of the questions I'm going to answer on this episode. Um, I don't think i'm gonna be be, i'm gonna be realistic i don't think i'm gonna get another one out this week um but hopefully this guy this gets you guys over to next week i'm gonna try have thomas over this week knock a couple out have travis over knock one out but again it is a busy week there is a lot going on so hopefully i'm not i don't have wishful thinking saying that but that's what i'm trying to do and then get and get some more guests on again but i know you guys haven't heard from thomas in a while from travis from some other people and friends that come on here. I'm going to get my dad back on here. I think we're going to dive more into masculinity topic. And so got that to look forward to. Thanks for everything you guys do in your sport. We'll see you guys on the next one.